All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So I want to welcome everyone today to our webinar, Five Tips for Legal Success After Graduation, Your First Employment Contract. The webinar is sponsored by ASDA's Career Compass and Treeler and Heisel's Business Brush Up Series. So I'm Danielle Bauer and I'm ASDA's Director of Membership. Um, I'm one of the 15 staff that work in ASDA's central office. So before we get started, just a couple announcements. Um, all attendees are muted so that we don't pick up any background noise during the program. And this webinar will be recorded and it will be posted on ASDA's website. A link will also be um, emailed to everyone who registered with the recording. So just a little bit about Career Compass. Um, ASDA launched Career Compass in April of 2017. And the goal is to help prepare students for graduation and to transition to that first step in their career. So the website listed on this slide has some resources for uh, graduation, the different career options that you can choose, um, postgraduate programs, getting a job, and resources for financial and practice management. We also um, will be holding monthly webinars on topics that will help you as you begin your dental career. We're going to continue to develop additional programs and resources for Career Compass and work with experts in the field, such as Trailer and Heisel, to provide valuable content. So during the program, you're able to ask questions. You'll see that there's a control panel on the right side of your screen, and you can type um, your question right into there, and we will answer those questions um, after the presentation. So. Today's program is going to feature um, two panelists. Uh, Christian Pearson, the National Director of Dental Partnerships at Treeler and Heisel, will serve as our moderator. And our presenter will be Ali Aramchian, as an, he's an attorney with the Dental and Medical Council. So Christian is Treeler and Heisel's National Director of Dental Partnerships. And in this capacity, he oversees outreach to general dentistry programs throughout the country through which he can deliver Treeler and Heisel's specialized expertise. Founded in 1959, the firm has a solid reputation for quality products and its knowledge of the particular financial services needs of those in medical and dental professions. Christian develops business symposia, lectures, and other educational events to help launch students' dental careers on a solid foundation. And Mr. Aram Chien is one of the nation's leading legal authorities on topics relevant to dentists. Since its creation, the Dental and Medical Council PC law firm has been regarded as one of the most preeminent healthcare law firms devoted exclusively to healthcare professionals. His clients seek his advice on dental and medical practice transitions, creations of corporations and partnerships, associate contracts, which is probably what he's gonna focus on today, estate planning, employment law matters, office leasing, and state board defense. So I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Christian Pearson, and he's gonna share more about Treeler and Heisel's Brush Up series. Hey, thanks guys. Appreciate everybody getting on and appreciate ASDA for all your great work to help develop this program. Just a quick uh, announcement really on the business brush up as this is a new thing that we're doing in partnership with ASDA. We are looking to promote better education of our dental clients, especially as they're graduating and going into life in the real world. We found that working with you all over the years that you become trained very, very highly as tremendous and brilliant scientists in your field, but the business side is often neglected in your dental education. So to provide people with opportunities to learn all the other things that you're going to deal with in your career, we developed this series and we're going to continue to bring you expert lectures from different walks of life in the business industry that deal with dentistry. So our first one today uh, is my good friend, Ali from San Francisco. He has done tremendous work in the legal field with dentistry. He knows it very intimately as he'll explain to you and I'm grateful for his time and his uh, expertise to bring you guys uh, some wonderful information so that you get off on the right foot and, and make this next step uh, a very good one. So Ali, I will turn to you, but Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Danielle. Hi, everyone. Hope uh, uh, everyone's doing well. I'm gonna. I think I have access to the screen. Um, um, I'm I'm turning that to you right now. Oh, awesome. Okay, wonderful. So let's see. 
All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again for inviting me to speak today. This is a, this is a very exciting uh, topic, if you will, because all of you who are in your last year and you're ready to um, to get ready for your first job, this is one of these topics where uh, there's a lot that goes into it and a lot of misinformation out there. So we're going to kind of parse through um, some of this. Um, I know, uh, Danielle, you wanted to ask uh, one question before we began. Is that right? Yes. So um, I'm going to put up a question. So if um, participants, you can on your screen select um, the answer. Give you just a couple seconds. Should be pretty easy to answer. All right, so we'll go ahead. And so it looks like most do not have a job lined up yet. Okay. All right. Good well, good. Audience. Okay. No problem. So let's let's go through this. And this is the topics that we're going to talk about today are things that you're going to see in almost every employment contract. So um, let's just jump right into it. Uh, a little bit about. Um, let me see. Make sure this works. There we go. So this is one of my favorite slides that that I have, and the reason is is that because this is your future day. This is what your day as a owner is going to be one day when you own your own practice whether you buy it or start it from scratch and as you can see this is uh this is a lot of stuff and all, there's almost nothing in here about clinical dentistry because because when you enter in the workforce after graduation you're more than just a clinician you're going to be really gearing yourself up to be an entrepreneur an entrepreneur who happens to just specialize in the business of dentistry. And the reason why this is important is because for your first job, a lot of your future employers want to see that potential. They want to see, you know, that you are someone that they could potentially hand the practice to in the future. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone's looking at you as a future partner or someone who buys them out, but they are looking for some of these things. And the things that we're going to talk about in terms of the contracts are things that are valuable to them. They're business decisions that the that your future employers are going to make. And you conversely also have to know what these terms mean and how to negotiate and how to position yourself in a way where uh, they see you as, as, as a strong candidate for, um, for ownership and also as an associate. And my, in my experience, having worked with thousands and thousands of dentists nationwide, the difference between success and failure in dentistry is, is really not the big things that you may worry about. A lot of times we have a lot of clients who worry about, you know, are they going to get enough patients? Are they going to find a great job? Are they going to be paid enough? Will they be able to pay back their student loans and, and other concerns? And it's really not about any of those things. You are going to always have patients. You're going to be very successful. You, you are going to be able to pay back your student loans. Uh, you're, you're going to be able to do a lot of these things. The difference between success and failure in dentistry is all about the small things. It's all about the little things that sometimes we take for granted. Uh, and I'll give you an example or two. You know, as, as you get into becoming a practice owner, the type of loan that you get from one of the big dental banks is very important. Okay, and it's not just about interest rate or term, but it's about the entire process. You know, is, does the bank specialize in, in dentistry? Will they take care of you if things go wrong? Um, you know, same thing with patients and marketing. You know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of our clients worry about, am I going to have enough patients? Am I going to make money? And yes, you will have enough patients. You will do fine. But the question is, what, what do you do when those patients walk in through the door? How do you handle your reputation? How do you market yourself? to the audience you know how is that handled it's those little things that tend to make the biggest difference and as a student who's about to graduate and go into the workforce you may be worried about am i going to be able to find a job well yes you absolutely are going to be able to find a job and i'm going to a little bit later talk to you about some ways that we can help you find a job as well but there are jobs out there for associates uh, don't don't be fearful of that 
Uh, and and the, but the question really is, are you paying attention to the small things surrounding your job? So one of these things is going to be the things we're going to talk about today, the terms in your employment agreement. And the scary thing is, is that every year we hear really bad stories of young doctors who graduate, who are working for a dental practice, and they don't have a contract, they don't have anything written down about the terms, and the employer takes advantage of them. Right? Whether it's uh, a situation we had in Florida where a young doctor you know, signed a seven-year contract to work somewhere, and, it, uh, and uh, she was an orthodontist, and she saw over 150 patients a day. Um, and, uh, and, that, and that's the reason why the doctor made her sign a seven-year contract, the employer, because he knew that she would probably get exhausted and not want to stay seven years. Um, and so that was always kind of, you know, those little things are the things that, that cause us a lot of stress and can cause you a lot of stress. And so we're going to get into, into those details. And then the idea there is once we have, we're focusing on these smaller details, uh, then it's a matter of making sure that we're following these steps every single day, making sure that we're protecting ourselves every single day. And, and as you get into practice, you know, we'll talk about some of those strategies in a second. So I have a little video to stress this point because it's a really important point. And uh, let me see if this uh, it should work. Uh, sporting event, although I, I think I have a problem with that silver medal. I think if I was an Olympic athlete, I would rather come in last than win the silver. If you think about it, you know, you win the gold, you feel good. You win the bronze, you think, well, at least I got something. But you win that silver, that's like, congratulations, you almost won. Of all the losers, you came in first of that group. You're the number one loser. No one lost ahead of you. And they don't lose by much. You know, these short races, three hundredths of a second, two hundredths of a second. I don't know how they live with that the rest of their lives because they got to tell the story. Everyone wants to hear the story. Wow, congratulations, silver medal. Did you trip? Did you not hear the dog go off? Tell us what happened. Hundred of a second, and people say, "What was the difference in the in the margin there? What was it? Well, it was like from now, it was like now, 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 all right, so it's not exactly like that, but it is about the small things when it comes to dentistry as well. And, and I'll tell you, when it comes to wealth building and separating yourself and becoming really successful, you know, it's really important to focus on these uh, small things, which we're gonna talk about in detail. So just a little bit about me, so you know how I'm coming into this conversation and, and, and why we're talking about this. Uh, I am a dental lawyer, this is all I do. I work with dentists across the, the country on lease negotiations and partnerships and buying practices and opening them from scratch and of course, you know, as you're, you go into your first job, we work with a lot of young doctors in terms of their first employment contract, which is the reason why, um, which is the reason why Christian invited me to come speak to you today. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a, did a seminar for a group of residents, and we asked the question, how many of you want to be practice owners? And of that group of about 12 or so, two raised their hands. Everybody else wanted to work for corporate dentistry and they didn't want to become practice owners. And that was a really scary thought for me because I think dentistry is one of those professions where you can actually have it all. You can have the lifestyle, you can have the family, and you can make a really good living doing it as well. And so I wrote a little book uh, called The Strategic Dentist to help our young doctors empower themselves to become practice owners. And so if you're worried about it, if you're stressed out by it, there's a lot of great nuggets in there to empower you to become an owner. Because remember, the way to financial independence and the way to absolutely separating yourself from, from for everyone else, if you will, is to become a practice owner uh, and not just uh, working for someone. Uh, so, so keep that in the back of your mind. 
this is my family. Uh, I show this uh, picture really for, for a couple of reasons, but primarily to, to say that I've lived your life because my wife is a pediatric dentist here in the Bay Area. And, uh, and then, so I've been through it all with you, you know, the white coat ceremonies and, and the first job and the, and the dentistry and, and all the unnecessary dentistry that she, you know, did on me, you know, uh, in, in dental school <laughs> and, and all the things that come with graduation and finding your first job and entering into a partnership and maybe having it not work out and opening up a practice. I've lived your life and continue to live your life. And so, so, you know, the things that we talk about today are things that, um, that matter not just as me, the lawyer, but also as things that we uh, see happen in real life. And so, which is one of the reasons why I picked the the, the details uh, that we're going to talk about in in a second. So, so let's go through the tips because the topic here is the five tips that you have to uh, watch out for when you're getting into your first contract. And tip number one is is the compensation. It's very important that you are absolutely clear on how you're going to get paid when it comes to compensation. Um, and there's a couple of options that you have. And so, so for most of you, you will be paid a daily rate. And that means that you're gonna get paid uh, a certain amount uh, to work an eight hour day. And, uh, and that usually nationally can be anywhere from 450 to about $600 a day, depending on kind of where you are, uh, where you end up, uh, and also the, the size and the type of the practice. And this is very typical for practices who are hiring you maybe for six months to a year. And so you should expect that for the first six months to a year, you're going to get a certain daily rate and and the idea there is that you're you're just learning you're trying to get your hand speed up um and they don't know how you work you don't know how uh, um you know how you don't know how the practice works and so it wouldn't be fair to do it any other way uh after about six months to a year what we see is that we see a change now a lot of practices when they see that you have potential and that you're doing a great job they'll start to switch you to a percentage of your production or a percentage of your collections and so as an associate, you always want to be paid as a percentage of your production. You don't want to get involved with collections. And basically the difference between these two is, is this, uh, for those of you that may not know, a percentage of, of production means that you're going to get paid a certain number. You know, usually it could be anywhere from 25 to 35 percent of every dollar that you produce on a patient. Okay. Collections is you get that same percentage of every dollar that the practice actually collects from a patient. So if a patient, you know, um, you know, stiffs them and doesn't pay them anything, and you did, let's say, you know, two thousand dollars worth of work, you're not getting paid on that because the practice again didn't get paid on it. And so it's very important for you not to get into that game unless it's just the only, you know, the only job in town and it's where you want to be and there's no other options. You want to always try to do a percentage of production. Okay. And like I mentioned, 25 to 35% is really the range. Uh, it depends on a couple of things we'll, we'll talk about in a second, but higher is not always necessarily better. Okay. And, and, and you might say, well, why not, Ali? If I get paid 35% as opposed to 30%, isn't that better for me? And the answer is in, in the absolute term, sure, getting a higher percentage of what you produce is ideal. But the reality is, is that a lot of uh, practice owners don't really keep a close eye on their numbers. And so if their production, if their expenses are high and then they pay you a high dollar amount, they may not realize that they may be losing money on you, you know, and, and only realize this after six months or a year and you typically end up losing your job as a result. And so what I say is don't shoot for the moon, try to get it in the 30% range, you know, 30 to 33%, and you should be safe. Uh, but uh, try to always get a percentage of production. Now, the next item there is the day sheets. Day sheets are, uh, are, are something that the practice should give you every day for your production. You know, that's exactly what you worked on uh, on the patient and you know exactly what procedures you did and, and, and whatnot. It's very important that you save these, okay? It's very rare um, um, that, that people do, but this is something that we advise all the time. You can, I can't tell you how many times 
an employer ends up paying you incorrectly. You know, uh, sometimes it's on purpose, sometimes it's not, and hopefully, you know, it's not. But saving your day sheets is a great way for you to keep track of your revenue and how much you should be getting paid. Because if you're getting paid a percentage of production, you need to know exactly what you produce, and then you can multiply that by that percentage and get a sense of how much you should be paid. Uh, we see a lot of errors happening. Sometimes it's an office manager just not knowing what they're doing. Sometimes it's the doctor, you know, miscalculating something. But you always want to keep your day sheets uh, and and keep them for as long as you're working there, uh, and uh, so that you, if there's ever an error, you can always go back. Some of you may end up doing working interviews. Uh, so working interviews across the country, for the most part, must be paid. Uh, and so if a doctor asks you to come in to work you know that day for maybe four or five hours maybe you work there the entire day uh you know they have they should be paying you uh and usually they pay you a percentage of whatever the daily rate is and so if you're working let's say a four hour day and they were going to pay you 500 dollars a day as an associate they would typically pay you about 250 dollars or so um you know if somebody doesn't pay you is it the end of the world no you know if you're really trying to get the job uh you know i wouldn't necessarily ask for it if you if you don't want to uh, but uh they they should you know from a legal perspective actually pay you to to work if you're just watching and uh you know the team work and you're not actually doing any dentistry yourself then that's not paid that's just an interview Lab costs are sometimes split with associates. Um, so usually, if you're paying it, you're, if you're being paid a daily rate, there's you don't pay for any of the lab on your patients. But if you're getting paid a percentage of your production or collections, uh, the office may ask you to contribute a little bit to the lab. And so that may be 50 percent, it may be 25 percent, it might be more, it might be less. It just depends on how you negotiate this. So keep a close eye on this point. Um, and make sure you contact someone like me so that we can kind of guide you through it um, because it's not necessarily obvious. Uh, but, but you have to be careful about you know, whether or not you pay and how much of lab you pay because it definitely impacts how much you take home. Okay. So let's go to tip number two. Second tip is about the term of the contract. So, so most of the time you will be given either a six month or a one year term. And so anything more than that, you have to be very careful about. Remember the story I was giving you a little bit earlier, we had a doctor, an associate who graduated in, from residency and she was given a seven year contract uh, to work at, uh, at a place. And she hadn't actually reviewed the agreement, she just signed it uh, and didn't have anybody help her. And she got stuck uh, there uh, and after about, three or four weeks of seeing a massive amount of ortho patients, uh, she quit and the doctor went after her. And so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a crazy scenario, but six months to a year is really good because you get to tell how the practice works. You get to tell, you know, if you want to be there long-term or not. Um, and the reality is, is that your first job is really about you getting experience. And so if you can work at a couple of different locations, it's, that's, a, that's a great idea because you get to see how different practices operate. You may like certain things or you may not like certain things about, about how they do it. And, and what you really want to do is use this as an opportunity to take in information so that when you open up your own practice one day, you know what things you like and what things you don't like. And so I always, I'm a big believer of working in, in a couple of different offices, some private practice. There's nothing wrong with working with the you know, big corporations uh, because you learn different things. Um, and some of the big corporations have great training programs for their RDAs and, and DAs. And so you can learn a lot about how they do things for, for when you, you open up your own practice. Um, you will see some contracts with auto renew provisions. So uh, please be mindful of that. Uh, and so you need to know when your contract auto renews for another year or two, uh, you may not be able to get out of it sooner if, uh, if, uh, if it auto renews. So you wanna always keep a close eye on those dates. Of course, if you have someone like me helping you, you know, we should be able to give you the details of, of when it renews so that you can, uh, you can, uh, you, know, you can keep an eye on it and decide whether you want to stay there or not. Okay. Tip number three, uh, this is about termination. And so termination is a very important clause in these contracts. And a lot of times 
it's it you know we kind of ignore it we don't focus on it um, but you need to really know because things could potentially go wrong or you might be given an opportunity to buy a practice or you may have to move and so you may need to terminate your agreement and if you terminate your agreement you don't want to have to owe the doctor or the employer any money and so you want to you want to look at the notice period how much notice can you give someone your employer and how much notice must they give you if they need to terminate their employment. Obviously for you, the shorter the time, the better. So usually 30 days, 45 days is, 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 is good. Uh, for employers, they want a longer time period because it might be hard for them to replace you. So they're looking for 60 days, 90 days notice. Uh, it, something in between there I think is reasonable. Uh, and so always keep an eye on that. Uh, the shorter the time period for you, the better. Uh, what's reasonable, again, as I mentioned, getting it to that time period, if you have a 30 to 45, even a 60 day notice period, uh, that's pretty fair, uh, short of a, you know, a, an emergency or some other reason why you have to quit, uh, you know, that's pretty, pretty reasonable. Now, what a lot of employers do is they try to give you a much longer notice period and then they, but for themselves, they give you much shorter. And really the reality is, is that what's good for them has to be good for you. And so whatever the term is, if whether it's 30, 45, 60 days, what it has to be for both sides. So they can't give you a shorter period and then you give them a longer period uh, so that they take advantage of both ends of that. Um, they, it has to be the same uh, or, or around the country, a lot of courts have thrown thrown that out and so just kind of keep that in mind that the termination period should be uh should be pretty uh should be similar now one of the hot topics uh is the covenant not to compete so let me explain what this is first before we get into what the law says so a covenant not to compete is some language that you will see in contracts where the employer prevents you from competing against them post your employment. So in essence, you work for someone and then they have language in their contract that says you can't open up next door or down the street or you know, within a certain mileage of the office. And so this is very important because if you get a job in let's say your hometown and you're working for a doctor and you want to open up later and let's say he decides not to sell to you or you may not want to buy the practice and now you want to go open up somewhere else you may not be able to open up somewhere else in the same town so you may have to go 5 10 15 20 25 miles away before opening up your own office and that can be depending on where you live that can be a really far distance, especially if you want to work in your hometown. So, so the covenant not to compete is, is a very important document, is a very important paragraph that you have to keep an eye on and make sure someone explains it to you. Unfortunately, the law regarding a covenant not to compete varies around the country. So depending on where you want to live, this law could be different. So if you're in a state like California, then covenant not to compete are completely illegal. Okay, you, you know, no contract can have a covenant not to compete. In fact, it's been compared to slavery in California. And so, so we really don't like covenant not to compete. But a state like Georgia or Hawaii, uh, Florida, those states allow covenant not to compete. They allow them, but you, it has to be reasonable. And so what is reasonable? Again, differs state to state, but typically it's anywhere from five to 20 miles or so, uh, give or take, depending on the area. In Hawaii, as you can imagine, you know, five miles is basically the entire island, you know, many of the islands. And so, so, uh, so it has to be a shorter mileage, but if you're in, uh, you know, in, in, you know, Oklahoma or, or where, you know, where my wife did her residency in Cincinnati, uh, it's a very different story. It could be a little bit further out because of the metropolitan cities. And so so just keep an eye on that. Um, it's very, very important, but do not ignore it. Do not just sign a contract with it 
um, uh, you, you need to negotiate it or at least strategize a little bit before um, before doing anything. Um, and so so as, as one of the things that I always advise young doctors is that if if you're not sure where you want to work yet, then keep an eye on the on on the covenant not to compete, but try not to work in the city that you want to live in. If you know, for example, that you want to you know work in you know we'll use Cincinnati as an example. You want to work in downtown Cincinnati. Don't go get a job in downtown Cincinnati. Go get a job outside of the city limits so that when you're ready to own your own practice, you can do it in your hometown without any any stress. Uh, sometimes that's not possible, and if it's not possible, then then fine. You know we'll we'll deal with that. Uh, but but protecting yourself in that sense, if someone is pushing a covenant not to compete, um, is is that's the ideal way of doing it. We have seen very recently some lending concerns as well. Some dental banks, uh, as of you know, very re recently, are not giving loans to you unless you uh, go outside of that covenant area. So if you have a 20 mile radius, uh, then if you, they will force you to go get an office or buy an office outside of that 20 miles before they give you any lending for it. Uh, and so, you know, I don't agree with that uh, actually, but uh, that's something that they're doing in terms of, you know, for risk minimization. So just keep that in mind as well, but, but please, you know, absolutely uh, do not uh, ignore uh, do not ignore uh, those covenant not to compete. Similar to that, there's another kind of language that sometimes they put in uh, that has to do with the employees and the patients. And this is pretty much valid around the country, but sometimes you'll see a contract that says, if you take my front receptionist, you gotta pay me $10,000. If you take my office manager, you gotta pay me $30,000. If you, if you take, you know, um, an RDA, you know, it's $25,000. I mean, it just, it just depends on the language. And so, you know, if you steal a patient, you have to pay me $5,000 per patient. Those uh, penalties are actually valid. And so, so again, don't ignore them. Make sure you're talking to a professional so that we can help you through those. And sometimes, you know, we can negotiate it out. Sometimes we lower the dollar amounts, um, but this happens a lot where you end up working somewhere and the team ends up liking you more than their current employer. And then when you go to do your own office, they want to follow you. And, uh, and sometimes you're happy to take them because they're trained, they're strong, you know, they know what, what they're doing and they're good, you know, they can be a good part of your team. And so I would, uh, I would be very careful about those, uh, those clauses as well, okay? The next thing is regarding independent contractors versus employees. And so let me, uh, let me kind of take a step back with this as well. So there's two kinds of contracts that you may get. You may get something, uh, you may get an independent contractor agreement or you might get an employment agreement. And they're very, very different. Okay, and the the reason really between the two, or the difference between the two, is that with an independent contractor agreement, you have to pay your own taxes on all the wages that you earn. So, so when you earn money, uh, the employer typically, if you're an employee, pays for half of your uh, uh, Medicare and FICA and Social Security tax, and then you pay the other half. That's typically what happens in an employee-employer situation. When you're an independent contractor, the employer pays you a sum of money and they don't pay any tax on it. You pay the entire tax. Okay? So you might say, well, why? why would they do that? And why would I accept that? Why would I wanna pay more tax than I need to? Well, the employers do it because they clearly don't want to pay the tax. You're already earning a lot of money and they don't want to worry about paying that tax. And they want to pass that on to you. You might look at it and say, well, why would I take that on? Well, believe it or not, being an independent contractor is actually good for you as well. Even though you're paying more tax upfront, you pay less tax overall because you get some perks by being an independent contractor that you do not get as an employee 
okay? This is really important. So you get to deduct things that you would not be able to normally deduct off of your taxes. And so, so, so it's actually good for you and it's good for them too, but it's important to work with a dental CPA who really understands this concept so that they can you walk you through it. Now, the problem is, as you can see from your screen, is that the IRS does not agree, okay? The IRS says that the employer can't do that and that you shouldn't have to do that. Uh, and uh, they actually are auditing a lot of dental practices because of this, uh, because they know it's being abused. Unfortunately, because of the way you know employers do this and the dollar amount that you know are attributable to this, because you know you're making 100, 150, 200 thousand dollars potentially as an associate, so the tax that an employer saves could be pretty great. You may not have a choice about whether you get hired as an independent contractor or an employee. Um, and so if you don't have a choice and you really want the job, don't argue about it. Give us a call. We can walk you through how to minimize your, your chance of getting audited from the IRS. Uh, but, uh, but, but don't give up that opportunity to work there because most likely than not, they will not change their minds. And it is unlikely that you're gonna be able to convince an employer to pay you as an independent or as an employee when they should be paying as an independent contractor or, or vice versa, okay? Hey Ali, so, can I make so, one quick uh, comment on that? Please, yeah, Christian. So just a point of uh, another layer to this is that if you do get audited as an independent contractor and you should have been classified as an employee, we find that the law sides with you in the sense that the employer misclassified you. They should have classified you as an employee, not an independent contractor. So there's really more fault on the employer who's technically skirting the law by not making you an employee. For the most part, as the definition of the IRS code looks, you're an employee. You're going into their office. You're seeing their patients. You're using their equipment. You're really not an independent contractor. So we see it all the time in dentistry from the financial side, and Ali's absolutely correct. If you are an independent contractor, there's some great tax advantages and some other things you can do with retirement plans and benefits for yourself. But I would say of the independent contractors that I know, 10% are really independent contractors. The rest of them really should be employees. Yeah, that's exactly right, Christian. That's exactly right. And and But most of our clients hire their associates as independent contractors for all the reasons we were just discussing. And so, so yeah, Christian is absolutely right. The, the IRS will come down with a hammer on the employer more than on you, but you will also, you know, have to pay some things back. But the good news is that there are some strategies for avoiding, uh, or not avoiding, but minimizing the chance of you getting audited. So, so keep those in mind. Um, and, uh, and, and what I would say is, getting that job is more important than worrying about the status. So, um, so don't get too bent out of shape if, uh, if, you, don't, if you don't have a choice. Um, you, it's still probably better for you to actually get the job than, uh, than, than not, okay? So, so there is light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, these were the top five uh, things that we see uh, come up in an employment contract. Uh, I sometimes get the question, what if I'm not given an employment contract? Is it, is it all that bad? Or my employer doesn't want to spend money on a lawyer to put it together and, and I don't have the money to have someone review it. And here's what I would say. If you're in that situation and your employer does not give you a contract and you really want to work there, the, at the very least, what I would ask you to do is put an email together and just spell out the terms that you guys have agreed to. Good morning, doctor. You know, as we discussed yesterday, you're going to pay me $600 a day uh, every two weeks, and I'm going to work three days a week for you. Uh, you know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Right? And I'm going to work on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays. You know, just spell it out a little bit in an email. Send it to them and ask them to verify that that information is correct. And the reason I say this is that from a practical perspective. Although most people are good people, we see this enough where you will work somewhere and there will be nothing written. And then, you know, air 
errors happen and, and people don't get paid and then you get you leave upset and so if they don't give you a contract don't worry about it but at least put this stuff in writing um if they do give a contract to you then make sure that you have someone review it uh, because it's it's really that uh, that important. Um, we have a white paper uh, with a lot of tips, uh, like the ones that we've talked about, and, and some more things um, that we'd be happy to send you. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's almost complete, and so if you'd like to get this white paper, um, you know, uh, uh, go ahead and text the word "as the rocks" uh, to this phone number, uh, and uh, what we'll do is uh, you'll get. To, the white paper when it's ready um, and, uh, and and it's really meant to kind of dive deep into some of these things about your first job and what your options are uh, in getting your first job and uh, and what things to look out for and, and traps we'll, we talk a little bit about incorporation in the white paper as well about how that can protect you on so many different levels and so so um, so make sure if you want uh, to, to to get that to go ahead and and, um, and to, to take that what um, to that number and as we kind of get to the end uh, there are some keys to success right we talked earlier about the importance of focusing on the small things not always just worrying about the biggest things but really focusing on the small things and one of the things I would have to tell you is absolutely find professionals who specialize in dentistry it is so important that you work with folks who know the industry inside and out whether it's a lawyer, whether it's a CPA, a lender, you know, anything along those lines, you want to work with people who understand your industry. And the reason is, is that, is that there are things that are so specific to you that they can help you with that most cannot if they don't know the industry, okay? including, you know, how much you should get paid, you know, what's the percentages and, and, and you know, what, what, you know, what should the contract say? Or how do you, you know, offset, you know, going to CE courses and other things from your taxes? You know, there's just a lot of things that people who specialize in dentistry can help you. The second thing is, and this is something that Christian, maybe you can speak on as well, but that I see a ton, which is that a lot of times, you know, you have some disability policies, some malpractice cover coverage policies that you get early on in your dental career, whether it's in school or right after, and then you never look at it again. And and this is one of those small things that's very, very important because God forbid something happens to you, a skiing accident, a surfing accident, you know, uh, almost anything or a debilitating disease, um, you want to be able to have the coverage to protect yourself and your family. Um, and same thing on, on malpractice. Uh, you want to make sure that your malpractice insurance covers you. Uh, some employers, especially the big corporations, uh, ask you to use their malpractice insurance as opposed to having your own. Uh, Christian, I'd love to hear what you think about it. I, I never advise the, uh, I never advise that. I always say, you know, make sure you have your own malpractice coverage and maybe ask yeah, your employer to reimburse you. Yeah, I agree. If, if they give you an opportunity to have your own protection, get it. I think what Ali and I are probably seeing more and more now, though, is these bigger corps are buttoning down their their loose ends and making you take their coverage and be protected under their policy. You would just want to be cautious to know what the situation is as you exit that employment. We, we find that if you do stay in a corporate location, the average length of employment is about two to three years. There could be lawsuits that come after you've, you've left and done other things, and you just want to know how you're going to be represented in that situation should your reputation be on the line for work that may not even be yours, but you're in the file, you're on the chart, you're a part of that patient's record that could be problematic. So um, always have the opportunity, if you can, to have the conversation to get your own. But if you can't, then just make sure you know what's involved in that if you're uh, going to be involved in a group setting where they're going to have your own malpractice or they're going to provide it for you. And with disability, you always want to have your own coverage. You may bounce yeah. around employers. You may bounce around to this hospital or, or that um, corporate location or work as an associate. But if you get your own disability coverage, it's portable. You can take it with you wherever you go. It's your policy. Um, and there's a lot of uh, advantages to getting it as a student too with discounts and other things that are available out there. So advisable to to start that process and, and protect your biggest asset, which is you. And um, 
you know, your ability to make money and, and continue to live the life you want to live is predicated on your ability to do your job. And it's a very delicate career and delicate profession. So, you know, protect it the way you, the way you need to. Yeah. And, and some states, you know, you might be able to get a disability policy depending on where you are that may have terms that are more beneficial than your home state. Um, and uh, that, that happened to my wife, uh, Christian, when she was in Ohio versus, you know, when, before we moved to California. So I don't know California, if that's still yeah. the case around the country or not. But yeah. Yeah. With individually owned policies, if you're going to, it's all based on where you purchase it or where you apply for it. So if you're doing a dental training or a residency, California's always a, a, a wild state as far as what's, uh, <laughs> what's available. Same with Florida. Ali and I live in the crazy states. It's the sunshine that melts everybody's brains and makes them nuts. <laughs> but the, uh, the uh, opportunity to purchase it and then take it with you should be explored if you're in other, uh, a state and moving back to California, moving back to Florida, moving back to New York. Those are states that sometimes have limitations that others do not, but you have the opportunity to protect yourself with a better yeah, contract so the, potentially now. Yeah, exactly. And so, so the key I think is start having those conversations now with Christian and his team so that they can plan for you. Um, because sometimes, you know, if you graduate and you move home, it might be too late to get those policies. And so, so, um, you know, that was one big piece of advice that, uh, that the local rep in, in Cincinnati had given to to my wife when she was doing her residency in Ohio and 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 it proved absolutely you know uh, to be the right advice you know before we moved to California and so so make sure you have those conversations early and then finally you know please you know have a dental attorney review your first contract um, whether it's me or someone else uh, it, it's totally fine just make sure you don't go into it blind um, it's uh, it's money well spent. Uh, and and re remember that it's really about the little things that 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 can hurt you with that contract because you you never know where you're going to end up and 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 how you know some terms in there may may hurt you. We have some you know you know because we we do so much work with the ADA and, and various other state organizations. We have some um, you know some special pricing that we give to students just to kind of make it more affordable because we were in your shoes not too long ago. Uh, but but really, it's not about that. It's really about just have someone review it. Okay. Um, so I think we have another poll question, uh, right, Danielle? Did, did we want to ask that now? Sure. We can launch the next one. Yeah. Um, or or if anybody has any other questions, uh, I think you can use the chat feature as well. So. All right. So we'll put up the next poll. If you can just take a second or so to. So, um, it looks like at this point, um, the people in the audience are not currently looking for a job. Are not? Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to my screen. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we can now open this up to questions. So. You should see a question uh, box that you could type your question into, um, and I will read that um, to our presenters. So, Ellie, we did have one question. Um, it came um, earlier in the presentation, so I'm not, they're asking how about New York City? And I'm not sure exactly what this is in reference to. I don't know if you know, this was a little earlier in your presentation. Um, yeah, it's um, maybe about the covenant not to compete or do you think it, it, it was earlier than that? Uh, oh wait, let's see. Um, I think it was around the covenant alley about uh, distance and I think it's about when it came in maybe. Yeah, yeah. New York City, yeah. New York City is uh, New York City is definitely uh, a difficult area in New York. In New York State, the covenant not to compete have to be uh, uh, have to be uh, reasonable. And so, so you know, what that basically means, obviously, you know, you you can't do the whole 
you know, the whole city of, of even Manhattan. Um, uh, and uh, and so what what I would recommend is that if if, if it's a building or it's a you know certain amount of you know uh, um, you know a half a mile a mile or whatnot that may be reasonable. Um, and uh, in a lot of times people will just do it in their building, especially in a big city like that. Uh, we had a famous case in, in Los Angeles where uh, the judge basically cut uh, the building and said, you know, they, you can compete, you know, above a certain floor and, and below a certain floor, but you can't compete, you know, on these floors. <laughs> and so, um, so most likely than not, I think, uh, I think it'll be very limiting, uh, especially in a big metropolitan area like that. Uh, but I would, that's one of those things where if you push back as an associate and said, look, I can't sign a covenant not to compete to not work anywhere else in New York City because of, well, it's New York City, uh, that's a pretty, pretty strong argument. So. Great. Um, the next question is, if I'm interested in working internationally, how can I start my first employment contract? Do you have experience I, with international contracts? I don't. I don't. Um, most of the work that we do is here stateside. Uh, what I would say is uh, finding a, a lawyer uh, internationally, you know, whatever country you're going to, that um, specialize, not doesn't necessarily specialize in dentistry because that's more rare, but that knows employment contracts and um, telling them some of the things that we learned today, maybe as, as may potential issues that may come up. Um, and seeing if it's in the contracts. Usually, uh, anybody who, uh, you know, at least in foreign countries that has experience with employment contracts would be able to advise you. So. Okay, thank you. Um, that looks like all of our questions. So we're gonna go ahead and just launch our one last poll. Um, so if you could, again, just take a second or so. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and close that. And so it looks like a, a fairly even, um, although some with all of the above. So right. that's, I guess, not too surprising. No, no, it's 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 not. And um, and, and I and. and you know, I'll, I'll make a few comments about that. I think, I think, I think debt is is definitely a concern. Um, you know, we 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 got our first client actually recently that had nine hundred thousand dollars of student loans, and uh, it, which is an incredible amount. And he changed careers and all those kinds of things. Um, so student loans are definitely an issue. Um, but it's the cost of doing business, right? It's 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 um, it's it's the way it's your ticket into dentistry right and so so the good news is that a lot of the dental lenders out there do not use that against you um they don't use it against you when they're giving you your first loan to buy a practice or to uh, start one from scratch in fact when you want to start your first practice from scratch uh they actually pay you give you the loan based on your potential it's the only time in your life that somebody will give you money on your potential because they have nothing to base it on. Uh, if you buy a practice, they base it on cash flow and other things. So what I would say is if you are in that category where you have a lot of student loans, uh, be mindful of your other debts that you may have, you know, credit card debts and you know, car debts and other things. Um, keep an eye on those work with you know you know you know wealth strategists and advisors you know at trailer um, who can help you who can help you kind of plan and if you do that and kind of keep your debts and whatnot in line you should be okay and you shouldn't have any negative repercussions as far as getting a loan uh you know to do a project um, and as i mentioned you know getting your first jobs um, or getting a job is not going to be an issue. Uh, you are going to find positions. You just have to start early um, and start, you know, you know, talking to the people who um, may have those relationships. 
Um, but uh, but if, if for those of you who um, have text, you know, as the rocks to that number, um, you know, th there'll be a question there about where you're looking. And if you let us know where you're moving to and where you want to find a job, we have, you know, you know 5,000 clients nationwide that we can reach out to and, and help you kind of, you know, position you uh, and, and help you find, uh, find the right job. So, so feel free to let us know. Great. So you'll see up on the screen, there's the contact information um, for the uh, presenter moderator and for ASDA. So if you have any questions you want to you know, send directly to us, feel free. Um, we want to thank all of you for participating in this afternoon's program. Um, I want to really thank our speaker, Ali, and our sponsor, Treeler and Heisel, for presenting today's program. Um, just so you know, for any um, fellow colleagues that you have, we will be also presenting the same program tonight at 7.30. So if you joined in late or you know somebody else who might be interested, there's still time that they can sign up for tonight's program. Um, the next webinar that we will be doing is on May 24th. Um, so you can uh, watch for our website, uh, emails, we'll be um, sending out more information on that program. So again, I mentioned at the beginning, this program is recorded. So it will be on ASDA's website. Um, you'll also get an email with uh, the recording. And you're also gonna get a very brief survey on the program. And we would really appreciate your input so we can make sure that we're offering the resources that our members need. So with that, I wanna thank everyone and hope you have a great day. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Dolly. Thanks, Richard. See you, buddy.